Good morning, everyone in person and on Zoom. It's wonderful. Good morning, Dutch. It's wonderful to uh, spend this slightly gloomy morning with um, your smiling faces. If you want to follow along with our service this morning, we have an online bulletin. Uh, you can go to tcbc.cc slash bulletin, and it has um, all of the songs, the lyrics, and the um, Sunday passage in there for you to follow along with. If you would, uh, then stand if you're able, and uh, let's read the call to worship together. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. They feast on the abundance of your house. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Please join us in singing some songs. A few weeks ago, Pastor was uh, preaching that uh, these commandments that we're studying are not arbitrary, just rules that happen to be whatever they are. In fact, they have to be what they are because God is who he is. As we study and meditate on God's revelation in the law, we get glimpses of his character. Right? He is faithful, he's relationally pure. God always gives himself in relationship and never at our expense. Or for his own self-interest against our expense. So as we meditate on the law and this revelation of God, who he is, his spirit is at work, forming in us his character. And as God's people, we delight in that. We delight in his law. We delight in the beauty of God's goodness, even in the conviction of sin, as his word is at work in us. All right, so let's let's sing this hymn. Words come from Psalm 119. Take it nice and slow so you can meditate on it.
the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our First word we're going to hear from the Lord is our greeting to each other. So the peace of the Lord be with you. Go ahead and greet each other. God's peace. Good morning again, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many people in the sanctuary, and I hope that those on Zoom were able to share a greeting with each other as well. My name is Jenna Beitler. I am on staff here at TCBC, and it is my joy to lead you through the service this morning. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about our church. For those of you who might be new, we want to share a special welcome to you. Uh, we have a gift of a, um, a really nice travel mug, if I do say so myself. Um, they're back in the, the um, welcome center. They uh, have our name on it. They're microwavable. They're dishwashable. You can do everything with them. They have a little cap on it, so it's mostly travel safe, spill proof, whatever. 
Um, so we just want to share that with you as our little welcome for joining us this morning. If you can also, um, I would like everyone in the sanctuary to find a yellow card. In the overflow, it might be a little more difficult, so you can do it online. But we would love it if you would um, fill out our connection card. We love to be able to connect with those of you who are new, but also those of you who have come for years and years uh, it's just wonderful for us to know that you are here with us uh, so that we can be praying for you or just um, know what's going on with your life. So if you need to do it online, you can go to tcbc.cc slash online card or um, fill it out with the yellow card. The ushers will come later in the service and you can drop that in there at that point. Uh, there are so many ways to get connected to TCBC. And the best way to find out how to do that is through our website, tcbc.cc slash connect. There you can uh, sign up for our weekly email. You can find a small group. You can join us on Facebook. Uh, there's lots of things that we do uh, throughout the summer to uh, continue to build fellowship. And we want you to be able to take part in all of those. And so um, joining us online is a really great way of finding out about that thing, those things. But since you're here, I will tell you about a few of them. The first one I want to tell you about is called Popcorn and Popsicles in the Park, because we love alliteration here. <laughs> um, this was uh, sent out a few weeks ago. It was in our brochure. We were going to do it at Colbert Park in Savoy. And that plan changed. So now it's at Centennial Park in Champaign, which is by Sholem Aquatic Center and Centennial High School, if you don't know where that is. So join us Friday, June 24th. Uh, it'll be an after dinner kind of thing. We'll have a popcorn machine. Melissa, our children's ministry director, got like a real popcorn machine. And so we're going to have fresh made popcorn, which I'm really excited about. There's going to be uh, like a sack race, and you can win some cotton candy from that. There will be popsicles, of course. Uh, we're going to be sharing a story from the Bible. So all are welcome. Uh, it's not just for kids. Uh, adults come and can enjoy the popcorn and popsicles as well. So that's Friday, 20, June 24th. But before then, we all want you to come to our annual meeting, which is this Tuesday this Tuesday, June 24th. It's in 48 hours. 14th. Sorry, thank you. I'm pregnancy brain, guys. I don't do dates anymore. Um, so we will be having a light dinner starting at 5.30. Uh, we would love for you to RSVP to that. All of the information about RSVPing and the uh, details of the meeting will be at tcbc.cc slash annual meeting. Um, the meeting itself will start at 6.30, and so if you can't come to dinner, please uh, do still come to the meeting. You can also join online on Zoom, and all of that information is there. One thing I want to uh, point out is that we want to talk about the things that you want to hear about at this meeting. We don't want to, you know, Brian doesn't just like talking, just to hear his own voice. Um, so if you have topics or updates that you want to hear about, ministries that you want to know more about, you can email us at office at tcbc.cc before um, Tuesday at noon, I think we said, Chris, um, so that we can get those topics on our agenda because we want it to be uh, a meeting where we aren't just um, talking about the things that we as staff think are important, but that we want uh, the congregation to be excited about hearing about. So, that is Tuesday the 14th, which is in two days. So with that, I want to welcome up Jeff Raisler, who is going to uh, talk to one of our missionaries. Good morning, TCBC. We have a great privilege to um, serve God here in this community, right at the intersection of the campus and community. And uh, the mission team, uh, we have even a greater privilege because we get to interact on a regular basis with our campus ministers and our global missionary partners. You meet many of our global missionary partners sometimes on Zoom or when they come back to town. 
But sometimes we take for granted our, our campus ministers because they're here every week almost. And so t- this morning we're going to hear from, I'm going to ask Aaron Zhao to come up. And uh, you've seen him up here probably very frequently. But we're going to hear a little bit about how God's called him and uh, what he does. So Aaron, um, tell us a little, well, first of all, well, let's welcome Aaron. Tell us a little bit about how um, your connection to TCBC, University of Illinois, and how God called you into campus ministry. Yeah, of course. Uh, Morning, everyone. Uh, So I uh, joined TCBC when I came here for uh, my undergrad studies in um, materials engineering and math uh, back in 2012. And uh, really through through church and through uh, InterVarsity, the campus ministry I was part of as a student, God really transformed my life and, um, yeah, taught me a lot about my, him, him and myself and my relationship with him. I recommitted to my faith um, while as a student in college, and that really impacted me. And kind of uh, as I got to see other students impacted, uh, God called me into ministry as well. And then uh, Becky, also my wife, um, joined TCBC as, when she came here for grad school, and we met through TCBC as well. So. So talk a little bit about your um, ministry right now, uh, campus ministry organization, and how you see God working in you and and those around you that you're serving. Yeah, it's been a uh, difficult past two years in ministry um, with figuring out life in pandemic and ministry in pandemic and working with this new generation of students. Uh, But it's really been a blessing. Uh, I feel like for me, uh, like learning how to build trust and help the current generation of students grow has really challenged me to grow with them, I think has been a big benefit and challenge of this past year. And uh, it was really cool, particularly we just uh, came back from our end of the year kind of uh, summer retreat. Uh, And it was great to see a lot of the students engage as we we spent the whole week in Exodus and uh, just diving into scripture, diving into prayer and rhythms is actually kind of funny because I actually preached a sermon on the Ten Commandments while we were there, but I only had to do one sermon and just an overview for the Gen Z students. But uh, Pastor Brian has to do a whole series for the whole congregation, so I'm not envious of that. Uh, Thanks, Pastor Brian. But it was really fun to, like, dive into that with the students and even see some of them engage who have been getting to dive with the congregation here in the Ten Commandments and then connecting that to the story of Exodus. So, yeah, it's been really fun seeing students engage more with scripture and more with community. So, Aaron, uh, how can TCBC as a congregation pray for InterVarsity, for you, for what what's going on on campus? Uh, yeah, for us and our students, I think uh, a big prayer this summer is just for rest. Uh, probably a lot of you have experienced this, but pandemic life has been very tiring, and doing ministry in that has been very tiring, figuring out Zoom and back in person and uh, back to Zoom and all of that, so just good rest this summer. Uh, for Becky and I, just we're still learning what it means to be new parents with our almost six-month-old, um, and uh, yeah, that's a new experience, and figuring out that out as we approach the fall, and Becky goes back to teaching high school. Um, I think for ministry for this upcoming year, just prayer for our continuing ad- adaptations for this generation and continued pandemic and what it looks like to uh, invite students on campus uh, into, yeah, fellowship. Yeah, so thanks, guys. Thanks, Aaron. And um, I'd like to ask Sandy Lou to come up. Thank you. did turn it on. That's why I turned it on right. Okay. Um, I'm going to open with a couple verses from Proverbs and then go into prayer. Will you join me, please? This is from Proverbs 2. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, seek it like silver 
Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Will you pray with me, please? Oh God, we praise you that you are the source of wisdom. We praise you, Father, for inviting us to come, to take a Sabbath, to come and rest before you, to listen, to learn from you. We praise you, Father, for giving us commandments, for giving us guides to grow in wisdom and understanding of you. And we thank you, Father, for inspiring Pastor Brian to do this sermon series. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us for the many times that we don't treasure your commandments or we don't seek your wisdom first, like we might silver or the advice of friends. Father, help us to learn to come to you first when we need wisdom. Our world so desperately needs your wisdom and your understanding. We pray, Father, for our lawmakers. We ask that you would give them wisdom to look beyond um, party preferences to what is really best and needful for our country to live in peace and community. We lift to you the many lawmakers that are working hard and ask that you would give them wisdom. We pray for our communities, that we might have wisdom to know how to love one another well and help those who are struggling um, with mental health or those who feel marginalized. Father, open our eyes to the people that you need us to be reaching out to and to minister to, just to be friends. We thank you, God. Um, for the wisdom that you give doctors that leads to healing. We thank you, Father, that you have um, miraculously given our friend Neelan Coleman an appointment in June instead of waiting till the end of the summer. And we just pray, Father, that you would go before giving those doctors wisdom that there would be healing, a healing plan for his eyes. We thank you for protecting Frank Allegria's life. And now we ask, Lord, that you would give him the strength that he needs to um, adapt to new eating patterns and new healthy ways of exercise and living, and that you would give him the strength to keep this healing going. We thank you, Father, that you have provided a new medication for Ellie Reif. And we just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with her little body during the transition of medicines and that you would protect her body and help this medicine to do a full healing power so that she could run and be like a seven-year-old. We thank you, Father, that you are working in her life. We give you praise for your hand on Maggie Courtright this week, that in her surgery, Lord, you went beyond and above, and how well she's doing. Thank you for the gift of healing and goodness to her. Father, we lift Aaron and Becky Zhao to you, that they might have rest and renewal this summer, that they would... Um, have your wisdom and understanding for raising little Simon. Thank you, Father, that as new parents, they know they can come to you. And we thank you, Father, for the way that you are working to reveal new ways of doing ministry, for um, building trust in a new generation. And we just pray that you would continue to be with all of our campus ministers, guiding and directing them. Again, we thank you, Father, for Pastor Brian, and we thank you that he is opening um, your word to us this morning and helping us to understand more fully the goodness of your commandments. We pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through him today, that his words would be your words. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
children five through fifth grade can meet me out back. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Looks like we're in, in, uh, in the path of some hot weather coming up here. Um, just a couple quick things before I get started here. I, uh, thanks for all who came out on Thursday night. We, we had folks in our backyard for dessert night. And um, my wife from scratch made tons of desserts. So if you missed it, we're sorry. Yeah, thank you for all your hard work. We had 70 people in, the, in our backyard, and uh, I think all of our neighbors still like us. So um, it was a success. Uh, we're in the season where people are talking about primaries and, and voting and things like that. We actually need you to vote. So if you're a member here, uh, you've gotten an email about our budget. We are at the end of our fiscal year, and if you're a member, we need you to vote. We actually need a quorum of voters in order for this to be ratified. So Tuesday night will be part of the discussion will be about the budget, about our, our status. And in fact, uh, I want to invite you out on Tuesday um, for uh, our annual meeting, which is, yes, we'll have budget conversation, but really is about where are we as a church. And so I'm excited about that. I hope you can make it in person, if not on Zoom. All right, now I'm ready to jump in. Let me just say a quick word of prayer. Father, we invite your presence I uh, thank you for this morning as we talk about the seventh commandment, God, that um, you would give us tremendous grace. Lord, the topic, adultery, marriage, sexuality, is a painful one for many. And I pray, God, that this would be a space where there is healing and hope. And I pray, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel to point people to Jesus, point us to you, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would give the peace of God that surpasses all understanding in our hearts right now as we talk through this subject in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Exodus 20, 14. You can open your Bible. You can flip to your phone. You can look at the screen. But if you don't move now, you will miss it. Exodus 20, 14. You shall not commit adultery. This is God's word. This is some of the shortest texts in history, right? Um, again, in Hebrew, two words. I, I got to go to South Africa a couple times on mission trips. The first time I was there, I was there for two weeks. I would be walking along places, and I'd keep running into people, or people would keep running into me. South Africans are very pleasant, though. So it was, oh, I'm sorry. You know, they would always take responsibility. But I, I just felt like it was uncanny. Why do I keep running into people? Every time I'm walking somewhere, I keep bumping into me, people or they're bumping into me. You know, I go a few more steps, boom, excuse me, I'm sorry. A few more steps, boom, excuse me, I'm sorry. A few more steps. I'm like, what is it? Like, do you guys not see me? What's going on? And then about halfway in my trip, it dawned on me. In America, we drive on the right side of the, sh the road. <laughs> we walk on the right side of the path. They drive on the left. Oh, I'm walking the wrong way. That's what's happening. And I realized, I need to walk on the left side. And everything was much better. <laughs> As we talk about the topic of marriage and sexuality, for you to grasp a hold of what scripture teaches on that and then engage in the world around us, you're going to keep bumping into what culture is saying. You're, it'll take a few more, you, you turn on TV, you'll bump into something. You read 
you know, whatever literature you, you're in the, in the grocery aisle and you see the, the magazines, you're going to bump into something. You have a conversation with a colleague, you're going to bump into what culture is saying. And if you're not careful, you'll think maybe I should just turn and go the way they're going. But here's the thing. What is at stake is more than just an idea. What's at stake is our faithfulness to God. What's at stake is nothing short of the glory of God and the faithfulness that he calls his people to throughout the ages. The title of the sermon today is Marriage and Sexuality. There's three points I want to highlight as Scripture talks about the topic of adultery. Number one, high hedges. Number two, humble holiness. Number three, hopeful wholeness. High hedges around the concept of marriage. Humble holiness as we think about sexuality and hopeful wholeness for our bodies and souls. As we've been going through the Ten Commandments, it really is, in summary, as the Scripture summarizes it, about loving God and loving our neighbor. The first four about loving God, the last six about loving our neighbor. neighbor. And in fact, over time, uh, just sort of... Um, in, in, in talking about the Ten Commandments, theologians say that there's the two tables. There's the loving God and then there's a the loving neighbor. Now, of course, the two tablets actually had all ten. But that's sort of how we, that's how we can think about it. And there's a purpose behind the commandments. It's to revive you. What revives you? When you wake up in the morning, you're tired, you're weary. Is it a nice, fresh, freshly brewed cup of coffee? Arabica bean? Medium roast? Do you put sugar in yours? I have to have a little cream, sweet cream, but you know. Or, or is it a workout? Or is it going for a walk? Well, Scripture says that the law of the Lord revives the soul. That's what David says about it in Psalm 19. The law should revive you. It makes wise the simple. That is what the impact of God's law, the Ten Commandments, His moral code, should do in your life. And you know it's working when it, start becomes, it, it becomes something that you cling to rather than run away from, that you embrace rather than reject. So first point, high hedges. Do you ever trim your hedges? I never trimmed hedges until, you know, a year ago or so, right? Because we lived in New York City, you don't have hedges. Um, you don't have anything that's green. So you trim the hedges. And, and you ever like you trim this hedge and then you trim the, his, oh wait, this one's a little shorter. So you got, okay, I got to trim this one. And then you keep going, oh wait, oh no. And then you go back and then it's just, okay, what happened to the hedges? Oh, well, you know, I was. See, our culture has trimmed the hedges on the concept of marriage. It's gotten lower and lower. We had the sexual revolution in the 1970s. Trim the hedges. We see the trends of divorce spiking in our country. Trim the hedges. When you look at the research on marriage, um, not only has it been the issue of divorce, now people are getting married later, trimming the hedges more. Obviously, in 20 you know, 15 or whatever, we redefine what marriage is as a, as a Supreme Court, trim the hedges more. In 2019, we hit a record low for the marriage rate in our country, a record low. In 1970, for every 1,000 unmarried adults, 86 got married that year. In 2019, the last time this record has been published, for every 1,000 unmarried adults, 33 got married that year. 86 in, 90, in, in, in uh, 1970, uh, 33 in 2019. 50 years, it just it's plummeted, all-time low. That's what our culture has done to marriage. But conversely, what Scripture does to the concept of marriage from Old Testament to New Testament, is it builds it up. The hedges get higher. 
You see, <clears throat> we read here, thou shalt not commit adultery. And if you look at some of the explanation of this commandment in Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 20, God is saying the reason why, and he gives specific, okay, don't have sexual relations with, and then he gives a list. And he says the reason is the people who been in the land before you, when I'm taking you into the promised land, the ones that were in the land before you, they practice that way, and I am spitting them out of the land. If you live that way, I'm going to spit you out too. Well, it took several hundred years, but the Israelites didn't keep their end of the bargain. But the point is, is that God was desiring that his people would live holy that he, they would be like him, that they would be faithful as he is faithful. Now, if you look at the text, I mean, thou shalt not commit adultery. You could get into, well, what does that really mean? Does that prohibit polygamy? I mean, we see polygamy in the Old Testament. How could you say there's a high hedge around marriage if there's polygamy? Well, so here's the thing. If you, the, there's something interesting about Hebrew writers. When they write about polygamy, in every single case, that family, they could be on reality TV because it is so messed up. There is drama in every single family. If you think about it, go back and read it. Don't take my word for it. Every single time there is polygamy, there is massive drama. And what the Hebrew writers are saying is, this is not the way to go. They're actually sub they're subverting the cultural norm in the ancient Near East of polygamy. Divorce was even allowed by Moses, but when he's, by the time we get to Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount and in his uh, ministry um, in the Gospels, Jesus is saying, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart. Actually, when you get married, the only reason that you should ever divorce is if there is adultery. Otherwise, you need to stay married. Some of the some of the, uh, the rabbinic teaching, the, 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 the um, oral traditions were around marriages. Like, well, if, if she spoils the dinner, you can remarry. If, uh, if you find one more beautiful, you can remarry. Jesus is saying, no, that's not God's heart. I'm building the hedges around marriage. And unless there is an actual breaking of covenant, stay together. Marriage in Scripture is like this diamond in the rough. And it's not that it's in the rough because there's something wrong with the concept. There's actually something wrong with our hearts. And the hearts of the people were hard. And so, therefore, the Lord, slowly over time, let me make this clearer and clearer. And so the seventh commandment is an invitation for us to have a high view of marriage. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Here's what Hebrews 13.4 says, Hebrews 13, 4, it'll be on the screen. It says, let marriage be held in high honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. Why? For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Have a high view of marriage in practice and in principle to be faithful. We are called to have a high view of marriage. Let marriage be held in high honor among all. Married or single, adult or child, we should have a high view of marriage. And God says that he's going to actually judge those who in practice or, or in principle, but certainly in practice, committing adultery, sexual immorality. You know, I, I, I got to, Becca and I got to hear one sitting president give a commencement address. It was back in the early 2000s. So George Bush was president. And we were in New York City, and we were ministering to midshipmen at the United States um, Merchant Marine Academy in, on Long Island. And so if you've ever seen a sitting president enter into a space, it's quite remarkable. You have multiple aircraft, the helicopters, 
they're not helicopters. They're so much bigger than that. They make so, it, it's, it's really, there's like five of them. You don't know which one he's in. They go to a, a secluded place. They get out. There's several limos. We don't know which one the president is in, followed by other cars. And there is a SUV with the, the hatch open and the biggest gun I have ever seen in my life. I'm like, he could take the whole crowd out, this one guy. The thing that is most guarded is most valued. God guards marriage because he has a high value, and he calls you as a follower of Jesus to be faithful, have high hedges. Well, you might say, well, why why is that? What is God after? What's going on? And we also acknowledge the fact that in culture, we're clipping the hedges You're saying raise the hedges. Well, therein lies the friction. To be faithful, to live in this culture, there will be lots of friction if you want to be faithful in the view of marriage in principle or in practice. So here's the second point. God's calling us to humble holiness. Humble holiness. Now, what do I mean? If we're going to be honest about the conversation about marriage... One of the things that we bump in, we, we, we're walking along, we keep bumping into things, we get bumped into this or that. But I feel like it's a punch in the stomach when a report comes out, what came out a few weeks ago from the, the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention, because it revealed not only was there massive abuse that was happening, there was a very coordinated cover-up for years. Even though people called for reform, lots of victims themselves were made to be the bad guy. And that is our largest Protestant denomination in the United States. And I don't say that to, um, I'm not vilifying the denomination. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. But the report is horrific. And so our culture would say, you mean you're going to stand as a Christian and criticize the way we do marriage and sexuality, but then at the same time you're covering up your own abuse? What's up with that, right? And it could actually be that, like I said, that punch in the stomach is like, well, what are we even, what are we even doing? Why, why, why uphold this? If this is in our track record, which, by the way, we have the church, there's lots of issues in the 2,000-year history. But let me encourage you. What we need more than ever is the gospel. We need to turn to the gospel, not run away from it. Because I promise you, for something to get that bad and that massive, the gospel was jettisoned on many levels. So what, is, what does it mean? What is humble holiness? Okay, well, what does it mean? What is even a, what is, how does the New Testament treat the category of adultery. Let's see what Jesus says. In Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. And again, he's critiquing the oral traditions around the commandments. He says in 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, like we've said, Pharisees put a fence around the law, and they say it only matters in the physical. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. That commandment goes much deeper than that. It goes all the way to the heart. And the word, the Greek word here, and there's three Greek words that are used in terms of um, elucidating what adultery means. One is present in this text. We'll look at the other two in a moment. But the lustful intent, epithumeo, it's the desire in your heart. It's the way you look at someone. It's the way that it's that Jesus is saying it's, Adultery, it's actually happening in your heart long before it ever happens in action. And if we get honest about that, then what that does is it levels the playing field. 
we're all guilty. And so it covers the range of all issues around sexuality that are about lust and desire in the heart. So Jesus is expanding adultery. It's not just what's happening in the physical, it's what's happening in the heart. Paul also speaks on adultery. 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. It'll be on the screen. 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Paul says, Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. I'll keep that up for a second. Um, you see what Paul is doing here? Remember I talked about the two tables of the law? He's going through the list of the second table. If you go back to the verse 9, he says, those who strike their fathers and mothers, what is that referencing? Honor your father and mother, commandment number five, right? For murderers, what is that referencing? Commandment number six, thou shalt not murder. But here's what's interesting. Verse 10, the sexually immoral and men who practice homosexuality. That's referencing commandment number seven. I'll come back to that in a second, but just to fill out the list, you see um, enslavers, liars, and perjurers. So you've got the thou shall not steal, that's the enslaving, and then the lying or bearing false witness. So you get, that, you get the second table minus the 10th commandment. But what Paul is saying is thou shalt not commit adultery has a much wider berth than what you might originally think of it. <clears throat> Two different Greek words he uses here. The sexually immoral is pornea. It's actually the word that was used in the Hebrews text, where God says, I will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterer. This pornea. You can hear the word, the base word for pornography. <clears throat> the other word that Paul is using, men who practice homosexuality, arsenokoitis. Paul actually makes up a word here. It's not found anywhere else in classical Greek literature, and he only uses it twice in Scripture. And what he does is he, it's, a, it's a compound word, basically, for male and for bed. It's clear that he actually, he's going back to, he's referring back to Leviticus 18. And to say this in a, in a delicate manner, since there's young years here, there are some who would attack Scripture and say, that's only a reference to a very narrow definition of homosexual practice. Paul had another word he could have used if he, had, if he was going in that way, but he actually made up a word. And so what that means is it actually covers what we're talking about today, the, the concept of practice. Now, I, am not, I want to be clear. This is not, this is not about um, attraction. This is about practice. What he's condemning is a practice, not, a, not, not attraction. And I also want to just make clear that when you put Sixth Commandment and Seventh Commandment together, the Sixth Commandment, it, it says that every life matters, right? And so, therefore, as Christians, we've done a poor job, a terrible job in a lot of cases of this. For those that are in the LGBTQ community, we need to honor and, and, and dignify who they are as people. But at the same time, holding on to the Seventh Commandment, which says, you know what, there's a high, there's a high hedge Scripture has for marriage, and sexuality. It's, it's, so it's, it's both honoring individuals and it's also honoring a sexual ethic. And so when you, when you read the New Testament, here's why I call it a humble holiness. What it does is it, it humbles all of us. It covers all of the bases. Christianity doesn't bifurcate and say, well, some are, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're straight, so you're good, and you're gay, so you're not. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says all are sinners. All need grace. And so therefore, in the, in the seventh commandment, all of us are guilty. All need Jesus. We all need Jesus. It makes us humble. Instead of having a haughty, 
oh, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm doing the right thing, but look at those sinners. No, no, no. Paul says, but such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified, he says that in 1 Corinthians. It's, it's a recognition. God is calling us to holiness, but not haughtiness. There's a humility. And so when you see someone caught in sin, it's not, it's not oh, look at how terrible. It's no. If, but for grace, that could be me. In fact, Paul says in Galatians 6, when those of you who are spiritual, you see someone caught in sin, you restore him, but watch yourself lest you be tempted. And we ought to have that full grasp of sexuality. That we are all sinners, yet we want to hold to the high hedge that Scripture calls us to. Not because, again, this is arbitrary, but because it is reflecting of our God. What God is after, what He is after, what He's contending for in marriage, is that a marriage is singularly representative of Jesus' relationship with the church. And God is protecting that. He's putting hedging around that, hedges around that. It is well guarded. Here's our last point. Hopeful wholeness. That's what we need. As a sexual revolution started, the mantra sort of became, it's your body, do with it whatever you please. Whatever satisfies you, whatever gratifies you, there's lots of, which by the way, though this expressed in the 70s, this was a long trajectory in our culture of buildup um, from the high levels of uh, philosophy and, and then into the mainstream of practice. It's a long buildup. My body belongs to me, though. That is a core tenet of the sexual revolution, a core tenet. Freedom is in doing what your body wants. But, you know, in the last decade or more, we've, we've moved into a whole new space, transgenderism. And, and therefore, there is a new message. So before it was well, your body, fr true freedom is do what your body says, do what your body feels. Now, now we have soul and body, soul versus body, your true self is what you feel inside, and your body is a prison. And so to have true freedom, it's to make your bad body match, match what your soul is saying. That's the message for our culture, and it's gaining traction. Uh, there's a new study, 1.5 1, 1. million people, I think, in our country are now transgender. It's mostly grown in the teenage and young adult population. But here's my question. I heard a testimony or a testimony slash just uh, a, a transgender woman was talking about her experiences and just basically saying, I can't have mirrors in my house because I don't want to see myself. What is our message for that as a culture? Because what scripture offers us is a different message and I would say a better message of hopeful wholeness. And the underlying principle is this, that your body and your soul do not belong to you, but they belong to God. And then that is true freedom. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 19 and 20. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that he who, I'm sorry, that's 16. Do you not know uh, uh, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. In the same way that God redeemed the Israelites, he purchased them, the Passover lamb, the blood of the lamb covered them, they were able to be snatched out of Egypt. It says that he bore them up on eagle's wings, and he brought them into the desert to, to worship him and then ultimately to the promised land. On a personal level, 
Scripture says you've been redeemed, that you, that your body and your soul belong to him. And there is hope for you. And so, and, and by the way, I, I want to acknowledge like gender dysphoria, that is a real thing, right? And I, I want to honor the fact that people struggle. But here is, I think, a more hopeful message for you. When Jesus died and he rose again, he didn't just raise as a disembodied spirit. He rose body and soul. And he gives you the promise that one day you will rise. Not just a disembodied soul in heaven. That is our intermediate state. But one day the new heavens, the new earth comes. You will receive a body. And so whatever is going on internally you have hope that one day you're going to have a body and soul that will be perfect. There will be no dysfunction. There will be no disorder. There will be no confusion. That's a more hopeful message. It is a hope for the disabled who are in Christ. One day I'm going to have a full working body. It is hope for, I I think about David who was baptized a few weeks ago. One day, he's going to have a glorious voice in the resurrection. A glorious voice. That is the hope. That is the hope. That is the hopeful wholeness for us, body and soul, in our sexuality, wherever we are this morning. So, in conclusion... God is calling us to have high hedges around marriage. Yes, it's going to mean you bump into to culture. It's going to mean awkwardness. It's going to mean that there's pain. Which, by the way, if you're married, cherish your spouse. If you it, 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 spend time together, don't allow drift to enter in. Be intentional. Married or single, have a high view of marriage. Whether God calls you vocationally to be single or he calls you to be married, have a high view. It's a caution for us to not lose our value of marriage just because of what is happening in culture around us. But it's also a caution that we would not have a haughty view of our culture while we think we are self-righteous or self-justified. You are called to humble holiness, which means if you're tempted to cut off temptation, that's what Jesus says, cut it off. If if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Whatever that means, a relationship, an access to a computer, whatever it is, you cut it off. If you're compromised, you're, you're in a situation that doesn't honor God, you need to flee that. You need to get out of that. You need to seek help. Seek those that are wise and are spiritual who can help you. Pursue righteousness. Maybe you're dealing with shame from your past. The gospel offers you forgiveness and mercy, removes your sin as far as the east is from the west. And by the way, Jesus, he is humble in heart, and he is a friend of sinners. And In principle and practice, if you view your body as your own or your soul as your own, You're cutting yourself off from the true freedom you could have. You're actually walking in bondage, and the gospel offers you freedom in the resurrection. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. There's a lot to process. But I pray, God, that we would be those whose hearts are open to you. And recognize that what our culture ultimately is offering offering us is an idolatry of self rather, rather than the worship of the true God. God, may we be faithful worshipers of the true living God, creator of heaven and earth, and not idolize the self and our desires so that we could be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Pastor Brian, for that reminder that we are free in Christ. As we transition now to a time of response, um, I just want to give us all a couple moments to kind of soak that in. Um, so Trevor, if you can play just a little bit bef before you start singing. Um, on the connection card, you can write a response if you have a thought or a, a prayer request that you need to share. Um, and then I want to tell you that we have shepherds. We have leaders in the church who are, I'm going to, Pastor Brian has made me cry once a week for the past month. <sighs> um, they want to walk this road with you of your pain and your, um, your guilt, whatever you're experiencing. Um, they will come down at the end of the service to pray with you. If you want something a little more private or a little more anonymous, you can um, sign up online. Go to tcbc.cc slash prayer. They will meet with you any time during the week. Um, we just want to be here and be a community together. <sighs> Sorry. Um, on a lighter note, um, please do fill out the connection card and then... Um, Ushers will come down and uh, take an offering. And uh, just know that when you give to the church, you give to people like Aaron, um, who serve our community and our campus. Um, you give to this building, uh, which is being used by so many more people than just um, us on a Sunday morning. So uh, let's just take that time. Let's pursue that humble holiness together as we sing this. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 
Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior.
receive the benediction. It comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now may the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Let's sing the doxology together. God. 